Hello everyone, good morning. Welcome to yet another day of the Reading IWE workshop. We have Professor Nandana Datta's lecture first up and welcome once again. And before we invite the speaker to the dais, may I uh, formally introduce her. Professor Nandana, Professor Nandana Datta is, a, is teachers at Gohati University in Assam. Her teaching and research interests are in American studies, gender, post-colonial theory and literature travel writing, and the discipline of English in India. Her publications include Questions of Identity in Assam, Location, Migration, Hybridity, American Literature in the Literary Context Series of Orion Black Swan 2016, and Mothers, Daughters, and Others, Representation of Women in the Folk Narratives of Assam, edited with an introduction in 2013, among others. She has published essays on issues such as identity, Ethnic Diversity, Location and Theory, and Assam and Modernity in journals such as Journal of Contemporary Thought, Interventions, Global South, and Journeys. She has also received the Katha Prize for Translation from Assamese in 1999, and she's been a friend of the Department of English, University of Hyderabad, for a long time. May I please welcome Professor Nandar for her talk. Thank you. So good morning, everyone, and it's very nice to be back. I don't know for the nth time. I'm taking advantage of something that I noticed and I jokingly pointed out to Pramod. My lecture was shown as open and Pramod very seriously got back to me and said, no, no, the others are also shown as open. I'm taking advantage of that open there and my lecture is titled, I have two titles. English and Northeast English Literature slash Reading Northeast Anglophone Literature. I think the term is something you have come across. I'll read part of it and we'll talk as I go on. So the emergence of Northeast Anglophone writing and its growth and increasing complexity as, and variety has raised several questions. How it is to be read which is the theme of your workshop, is the most basic, growing out of the readings we have seen so far from within and outside the Northeast, very often in PhD dissertations and in occasional critical essays. The second question, what is the relation between the Anglophone literature and the local language literatures? This is something that we always talk about, but we haven't done enough work in examining this. What, what exactly and what are the sites where this kind of interaction has happened? We haven't really looked at it, so I'm flagging this as one of the questions we might keep in mind. And additionally, the relation between the literary, all the various Anglophone literatures that constitute Northeast Anglophone literature, I'm using the term Anglophone, occasionally I'm going to switch to Northeast English, and the non-literary, which includes books from different disciplines that also tacitly continue to engage with the conceptualization of the Northeast. Very recently, there have been four books, all of them on the Northeast. Sanjeev Barwa, Amit Bhasha, and Yasmin Saikya, book called Northeast India, a Place of Relations. And uh, Joy Pachao and Niladri Bhattacharya brought out a collection on reading the history of Northeast India, or writing the history of Northeast India, sorry. So these are books which are more and more engaging with the Northeast as an entity, something that had happened from the time of Variet Elvin and before. So I'm interested in flagging this as something that I hope to take up eventually, the third part of my paper. So this engagement, reference to our implicit assumption, has been ongoing, an idea that is constantly being shaped and that critiques of the literature and the region have not yet been able to shake off. Finally, a third point, there seem to be assumptions about the transparency of the Northeast literary text and of the Northeast, how simple, banal, and so on. Uh, some are negative comments, some are comments like, you know, we get queries that I want to work on this, this author. These are the things, these are the ideas I have in mind. And sure enough, you're going to get questions of identity, violence, trauma, these are very common and widely accepted, very popular features. So one result of this has been the practice of tagging a literary text to a recent history of violence, militancy, and accompanying trauma, especially evident in the now ubiquitous PhD dissertation, 
but in papers submitted in journals all over the world. In response to these and other similar questions, I propose a couple of reading strategies, both demanding knowledge of the history of the region and a literary historical awareness with regard to Northeast writing. You'll find implicit in what I'm saying that we need to think historically. What was the first literary text? What were the conditions where English writing would have seen to have begun? I think these are things we need to ex excavate, go and study thoroughly. So these two reading strategies I'm suggesting, assuming a necessary curiosity about the ground which has been fertile for Northeast Anglophone literature, I'm suggesting the notion of a literary public sphere and more specifically, an English literary public sphere, keeping in view the difference in quality and volume of English writing, uh, for example, between Assam and the other northeastern states. This could be specific to each state or common for the region. Its formation involves the ways through which English entered, the challenges from the ground, and the strategies evolved to deal with its domination. I'll give a couple of examples in a while. Secondly, a fresh consideration of the oral and the folk in its fraught relationship with English, script and language and colonial reading strategy, its erasure and recovery in the present as a strategy of defamiliarization, defamiliar lending density to texts and becoming a new political gesture. Thinking through a potential literary history, therefore, as a broad reading strategy would enable identification of the contextual material without which its development would remain inexplicable. Among these would be the history or histories of the region and of individual states. For instance, I myself hadn't given much uh, attention to something that was pointed out by Margaret Zama, Margaret Zama from Mizoram University, retired now. She talked about historical dark spots like the bombing of Isol Town in 1966. So, you know, instead of using the same old frame of militancy and violence which we have done for a very long time, there are also other forms of violence. So the whole, even if you want to work with violence, I think we can approach it from other directions than the usually accepted. So the bombing of Isol Town by the Indian Air Force in 1966, and the forced village groupings of 67, 68, and 72. These are things worth looking at. The nature of contemporary life, center state relations, identity movements, insurgencies, and most importantly, cultural revivals. Every state has a program of cultural revival going on. And vibrant literary cultures, oral and written, that form a backdrop for English writing. So there have been translations. For example, why was Alice in Wonderland translated into Assamese? We have several translations of Alice in Wonderland in Assamese. Assam is one case where you don't have a very strong tradition of English writing. English is much better written in the other states. But this is one thing that you know, is an example of what we might be able to do with the other states as well. The broad context would further include assumptions about people and place in colonial and missionary texts. These are available, you can check them out. And a region-specific response to modernity. Both Kire and Ao, for example, very popular with dissertations we receive from uh, parts other than the Northeast. Uh, they give an example, they use the term Dubashi, an interpreter. So the idea of an interpreter being a very important figure because we had so many ethnographers working there. We had British officers, we had American Baptists, and so many others. The effects of the fissure between the oral and the written, the second point, through the introduction of English education and in many cases of Christianity. The diversity of missionary groups, for instance, and the kind of English texts. You can see a bit of this, you know, the various missionary groups who uh, were there in the various regions of the Northeast. There's an essay. It was an address by David C.M. Lee, historian from Nehu, and subsequently, I think he was UGC chairman for a while. So David Siemle has this essay where he actually puts down who were the missionaries. 1629, apparently, the first missionaries came to uh, the Northeast, so prior to the East India Company. The diversity of missionary groups, for instance, and the kind of English text they introduced is something that has not been taken note of often enough. One school, I studied in Shillong, and a lot of my friends also studied in various other schools in Shillong. There were many schools in Shillong at that point run by different missionary houses. 
So these friends and I, we studied in different, I did this uh, sort of comparison later on. And one of my friends who studied at one of those schools, I won't name them now, uh, she said that they were taught African-American spirituals and folk tales. In my school, we were not taught those. We were taught Banyan, Pilgrim's Progress. And that was a reader at some stage. So this is something, again, that I'm admitting that I haven't done it myself. You know, it's, one has to go and actually go back and look at the material that these schools would have had, early syllabuses, what were they teaching when they began teaching. All that, I think, would show us that the kind of English texts that they had in school libraries, and schools always had very rich libraries. My school had a library. We were forced to take a book every week and read it. So we read anyway. The books that my school had were not the same as the books that my friend's school had. You know? And there was a library in Shillong. It was the state central library because Shillong was the capital of Assam in post-independence India for quite some time. It was a wonderful library for children. When the state states got divided, Meghalaya came into existence, the library, part of the library shifted to Guwahati. And some of the books came into the district library Guwahati District Library. We didn't have a state central library. It's still called a district library. The district library got some of the books. And I don't know how to make this connection, you know, that a very large number of biographies came into uh, the library. Somehow, maybe they didn't want the biographies in Shillong, so they gave them to this library. There were biographies of Sarah Bernard and musicians, Mozart, Bach, Beethoven. We read these unthinkingly at that stage I was still in school. So we've just read whatever we could find. What impact has reading of this kind had on the formation of the imaginations of people who now write? Temsulao, for example, was a student in my university way before my time. And she always had acknowledged that. So what did she read? The library holdings of universities and so on. So this is another area for us to look at. So a literary public sphere, partially in English and with components from the regional languages is a useful way of thinking about the emergence of English studies and of Northeast literature. A number of interesting responses in Assamese and English can be identified in this journey. I want to give an example because I know the Assam case a little better than the others. There were two, two essays which I thought I should share with you. One was a long report which appeared as part of what is called the Mills Report of 1853 on the revenue and judicial system of Assam. Written by Anandaram Thekyal Fukon. Maybe somebody has, some of you may have heard the name. Very famous figure there. And I'm talking of a public sphere mainly because of this, because people talk about these. We still talk about Anandaram Thekyal Fukon, his father, the work they did. And whenever there is a problem of language, and we are still having that problem of language, whether we should teach children in Assamese or English, now with the NEB. Dekyal Fukan's name comes up, because he wrote, along with this report, he also wrote three little readers in Assamese. They were called Ochomia Lorar Mitro. Any Assamese speakers here? No. Ochomia Lorar Mitro, maybe you know the text. So we talk about these texts. The young boys, boy was young child's uh, friend. That's how it would translate literally. So these texts were written by this man. He, was, he died at 30. So he was around 25 or so when he wrote this report to Mills. And here he argued for teaching young children in Asmis. So English was coming into a place. And his report is written in English, excellent English. Okay? So he also wrote in the missionary periodical Orunudoy. So you can see this you know, fertile kind of thing going on at this time. So this text is something I would like to put in there as part of what people, what went into how English was received. English was invited, English was liked, but in many of the magazines which also came up after Tekyal Fukon's uh, essay, of course, there were many magazines, and we have a very strong magazine culture in Assam, vernacular in Assamese. Many of them carried on debates about English education in Assam and what should be taught and where. Okay? So this was one text. The second that further complicates the response 
I'm just giving this as an example, okay? I think you can do this with other texts in each of the states. This would be for people to do further work on. The second that further complicates the response to English was an essay titled German Academic Ideals, published in the magazine called Forward on March 11, 1928, by K.K. Handik, eminent scholar and the first vice chancellor of my university, where he bypasses the example of England then at war with Germany, to speak glowingly about German education and scholarship. Okay? And uh, years later, I read this in Chris Baldick's, I didn't read this 28 essay before that. I read Chris Baldick first, and then discovered that this essay, German Academic Ideals, was actually replicating the sentiment that you have being discussed by Baldick in his work, Social Mission of English. It was in the wake of Foucault's response, the Mills report is very well known, as are Foucault's three readers, and Handig's position that Gohati University was founded and the first university department of English in the region was set up. Several among the first generation of English writers were students there, prominent among them, uh, Professor Temsula Au. Other aspects of the site of literary production that might be said to constitute a literary public sphere were publishers. Modern Book Depot was a bookshop we grew up with. I didn't know they were publishers until I was about 18 or 19 when I started finding books there that they had published. So they were a bookshop in Shillong and part of our birthday treats, everybody's birthday treat used to be to be taken to Modern Book Depot, given one book. Our parents couldn't afford more than one book. So we used to get one book for our birthdays and then be taken to the shop next door for ice cream and ginger beer. Okay. So book, this, this was part of that, uh, you know, treat, a birthday treat. The book was very important. And we gave each other books as presents. We shared books. So this circulation of books, what kind of books were circulated, this is again something that I think should be looked at. So Modern Big Book Depot was there. There were the, the publishing wing of Modern Book Depot is called United Publishers, and if you check online, you will see that a lot of Northeast books are published by them. They take out primary material as well as books written by people on that material later on. So the State Central Library, the Assam Tribune, founded in 1939, and being part of English, the English reading public. The Northeast Writers Forum came up much later, but the Northeast Writers Forum, the president of the Northeast Writers Forum told me that the first English collection of short stories was something that was published by a small publisher in Shillong called Chapala Bookstall, from where we bought all our school books. They had a publishing wing. We didn't know about it then. And they had published a collection, I forget what it was called, by a Sindhi gentleman from Shillong. There are lots of Sindhi businessmen in Shillong. They're still there. Many of them went to school with us, so we still know them. And the book was published by somebody called Melwani. Something Melwani, I forget it. Uh, Melwani had published the first book way back in the 40s, I think. So which is the first English book from the Northeast? I don't know. I was given a one from Mizoram called Zorami, uh, which was written earlier, written sometime in the 70s. Much of the later literature comes out in the 2000s. So uh, 71, I think, Zorami was written, was published in 2015. So all of this, I feel, and the work on their own cultures done by people like Temsula, Margaret Zama, Esther Siem in different states, this is something that I think would be part of what is forming the ground against which Northeast, modern Northeast writers are emerging. So this is part of what I thought would be the first part, first section. I want to look at a couple of texts in my next section to see how we would read the oral and fit it into a sort of dissident reading, if you like. The folk consciousness of all Northeastern states is seen in the form of objects, place, and re-readings of history objects which are associated with spe specific cultural practices. These could be crafted items of everyday use that simultaneously carry deep cultural and historical meanings. The shawls worn by women, by mother and uh, daughter, in the last song, a fragment of which is found amidst the charred remains of bodies in that story, is one example. This story from our well-known collection, These Hills Called Home, contains an intriguing bit of translation. She presents the 
uh, lower garment that uh, these people were wearing here as shawls, lungi, and skirt. All three terms are there in the story. To refer to a garment that in a later phase might well be retained in the original. Newer writers are doing that. That might initiate reflection on a changing readership. Places like the watering spot in a terrible matriarchy are integral to the life of a community. And an event in recent history, as with the graves turned to grassy knolls in ours, the last song, or one transformed by time into a blend of the mythical and the real, as with Pomrain in Janice Barriott's uh, Waterfall of Horses, can become part of an effective collective memory that links object and place. The three terms together, object, place, and history, demonstrate the simultaneity that was suggested uh, in 1994 by Chandrasekhar Kambar when he said that in India, the oral tradition does not belong in a pre-literate age. Both the traditions can coexist in a given period of Indian history. This is well known, but I'm just citing him because we needed something to anchor ourselves to. The material an author deals with may be drawn from history, but behind, beneath, or alongside these are tales, beliefs, and practices that have always been with the community. Such contiguity itself therefore becomes a style within a genre in many of the best works. Object, place, and history are signals offered for interpretation that are subversive of integrati integrative literary historical exercises. They position genre as one of the points, one of the points of organization, not the predominant one. And to unpack a comment made by Amit Bhusha in his thoughtful reading of the last song, he says, about the byplay between focal aspect, uh, vocal aspects of oral storytelling and the ethical imperative to listen, staged through the narrative situation at the end of the story, retelling with attention to minute details that heal communities and restore lost connections. So the political, as you can see, has always been part of the underlying uh, impulse. But they, they also offer a repose to constructions of the Northeast in ways that the mere adoption of a literary genre cannot. I'll skip some of the readings. We, I think we have a workshop session later on. We can discuss these then. I want to come to this uh, short story by Janice Parriott and read that briefly before going to, on to my final point. Or maybe just a little on Kire. Terrible matriarchy. I'll read just a little bit from Kire's uh, something I wrote on this. Easter in Kire's novel, A Terrible Matriarchy, you have, you have objects woven garments and all that. You have a place, and very interesting places. There are wells which are haunted by ghosts. This story has the young Dileno, herself poised on the cusp of change, watching a society changing, moving into modern ways, and yet rooted deeply in the ways of the ancestors, evoked through the figure of the stern grandmother, a matriarch who is capable of balancing in herself her Christian belief and her strongly located folk consciousness. Just digressing a little, recently I examined a dissertation which was looking at the indigenization of Christianity in Mizoram. It came from Mizoram University. So it was a fascinating study of how little practices had been introduced into the uh, earlier practice of Christianity. So the two figures in this novel represent two different ways of life and thought Vehicles Kire deploys to blend two belief systems. The ghostly occurrences create some of the most powerful moments in the novel, and it would appear that Kire is not just showing them as aspects of a parallel belief system, but in fact showing their continuing importance for individuals, repressed perhaps, but also impossible to ignore. The dead grandmother reappears as a ghost and plays an active role in setting things right, driving away unwanted tenants, and these occurrences are important for understanding how it is possible to exist sedately within two realms of belief. I mean, you can unpack them in so many ways. Unwanted tenants, the idea of the outsider or you know, the foreigner is such an important trope in a lot of writing from the Northeast. The graph of Kire's work, for instance, the movement from a terrible matriarchy through bitter wormwood to the river sleeps and its 2021 sequel, Journey of the Stone, and her recent retellings and collections of folk tales, all these show the increase, increasing focus on the mythical and the mystical in a recovery of the cultural resonance lost under colonialism. Michelle Lisserto has, you know, this is a writer I'm reading now, I'm finding him very interesting. Michelle Lisserto, whose work on travel texts offers so many points of entry into colonialist discourse, writes at one point of the connection between speech and writing 
in Jean de Lery's Brazil Travelogue. The speech of the Tupis, he says, that part of the other that cannot be retrieved, an evanescent act that writing cannot convey. This is followed by a request for translation from Larry, and the interpreter obliges, making a point to include in his translation the story of an initial deluge, which, according to Larry, most resembles scripture among them, enabling incorporation of the spoken word into a familiar Christian text. As Soto shows, Larry puts all kinds of sacred and profane writings together in order to appropriate them to the West. In a later piece written just before he died, Sertu had charted a program for future research where he suggested a way to read the colonial traveler accounts by identifying lapses and witticisms that reveal the story that is repressed in the text, a method that he had adopted to read Larry's account. What Sertu does here is exemplary because the route to recovery of the folk and oral that appears only in disguise or in giveaway phrases that pop up in spite of the intention of the traveler to downplay their importance in the cultures that they had colonized is through this preliminary identification of such methods of obliteration in the written text. Now the practical applicability of Sato's method is seen in reading texts that insert words or phrases drawn from the oral that resonate through a narrative, lending both structure and ambience. And this is here I want to talk briefly about Janice Perrier's short story of Waterfall of Horses, which plays on mutual cultural incomprehension. It begins with a reflection on the word. The Khasi word is used, ka tien. Once printed, the word is feeble and carries little power. But originally, the word was spoken, unwritten, unrecorded, old, they say, as the first fire, free to roam the mountains, circle the heath, and fall as rain. In a story of colonial oppression and dreams of revenge on the part of a poorly armed local population for the torture and death of an innocent man, the solution is found in the power of the word and its mysterious capacity once uttered to generate a series of events that destroys the entire village. The inexplicable madness of the horses as they charge down the hill and then to the waterfall, soaring over the emptiness and falling into the mist. In a collection of Khasi folk tales, there is a sh one folk tale is called The Leap of Kali Kai, same story. But this time, it's a woman who jumps over the waterfall. Here you have the horses soaring over the emptiness and falling into the mist, having trampled over and crushed to death a young woman who was being courted by an Englishman. It shows the sheer immorality and power of the word, so unlike writing that served as an instrument and was within the writer's power. Sahib Sam's question, Sam's question to the young narrator, what happened that day? So there's this play of comprehension and incomprehension throughout the story. It represents inability to incorporate the events within a rational linguistic order. Commonly understood notions of us and them that structure racial and linguistic difference are shattered as the word or mantra, mantra is used in the story. It acquires a life of its own, rushing through the little village and finally leaving it empty. Pariyat uses many such terms from the oral in her stories. In this context, one might also think of the word fawar, where, on which Desmond Karmoflang has written a, an essay. We can talk about it during the workshop. The one folklore genre that completely identifies the Khasi community, drawing on the language of archery with its style of performance in the call and response mode, aligning it with performance traditions in cultures all over India and the world. So this play between, you know, we are marginal and we are central, this is also goes on here. The association of archery with gaming, uh, one used by Dhruba Hazarika in a novel called A Bowstring Winter, is only one aspect in the density of these terms and practices. An idea into contemporary texts in English is a guerrilla tactic that de deployed to subvert texts, both colonial and contemporary, that either erase terms and cultures or absorb them under labels like savage, primitive, tribal, and northeasterner. The power of the word anchored to places is explored in creatively distinctive ways. Pariyat ends her story with a return to the present. Pomring, that's the village, is an abandoned village now. And something, I, I skipped all this, but you will see that many of the poems, some of them I sent to uh, those of you who are taking part in the workshop later on, many of these poems actually are 
on the names of places. And some of these places have associations which either go back very far or have to do with current events. The power of the word, so Pomerang is an abandoned village now. Only a few stones stand atop a barren hill. The one thing that remains is the waterfall, throwing up a sound, a word that is ungraspable and constant. Waterfalls, by the way, are a great attraction for tourists nowadays, right up to Cherapunji. This reference to a place where events happened and are retold is similar and yet different from the way place was used as a mnemonic element by Kire and Ao, pointing to distinctive cultures of memory in each of the states and of orality prevailing across the region. So in Ao's last song, Apenyo and her mother, they have been raped and killed by the uh, police forces there. And her mother are denied burial in the hallowed ground of the graveyard, but are laid to rest just outside its boundary. In a reference to distinctive memory cultures, there is a glimpse of the present. Today, these grave sites are two tiny grassy knolls on the perimeter of the village graveyard. And if one is not familiar with the history of the village, particularly about what happened on that dreadful Sunday, uh, 30 odd years ago, one can easily miss these two mounds trying to stay above ground level. You might also remember Toni Morrison talking about rememory in The Beloved. So there are other poems, other texts, where you can actually see the use of folk terms from individual cultures. I'll skip all this. And I want to come to a final point where I hope to tie up some of these things together, both the notion of the literary public sphere and the oral that under, they underpin my final point that I'm trying to speculate about. I'm trying to think about what could be a methodology that one might evolve in order to study the Northeast. And this is just, uh, as I said, a speculative, personal sort of reading of what one might do. A particular way of thinking about the region that I feel is implicit, but that perhaps needs to be articulated when we think of Northeast Anglophone literature, a way to think that includes two opposing attitudes. One, that of the region as a collective, and a second where each state is perceived in all its difference. All the books that have come out from there, you know, I was actually, I mentioned one, but I didn't read that. One, which came out in 2017, was by Sanjay Hazarika, who has written uh, quite a bit about insurgency, militancy in Assam. He wrote a book on the Northeast. See, this is what I was trying to say, that people have moved out of, or some have moved out of writing about individual states, but are looking at a frame which is the entire Northeast, engaging with the Northeast as a collective entity which has, which has a legacy from the colonial times, but also with the contemporary use of the Northeast, the economic discourse, national economic discourse, the look East policy and so on, these things, the Northeast features there, Ministry of Donor and all that. So in Sanjay Hazarika's book, he does something very interesting. He, it's called Strangers No More. And he begins the book with a long introductory chapter where he talks about borders, frontiers, uh, troubles. These, these are what constitute the first introductory chapter. And then he goes on to break up his chapters into individual states. So each state is discussed through personal memories, personal experiences, his travels in the states, and with the discourse prevailing about that state. So this is, again, you know, a way of engaging, trying to engage with both these aspects of the Northeast. So a second, the first, therefore, is a, the region as a collective. That's the first problem. And a second, where each state is perceived in all its difference. How do we simultaneously think collective and individual as we consider the literature? historically through carefully selected tropes, thinking through a distinctive kind of literary historiography. In other words, thinking through literary history, involving emphasis on context as well as on the formation processes of literary texts. A number of recent works suggest something like this. These books clearly flag the problem of how to study or write about the Northeast. I'll speak briefly about two. The first one, Northeast India, a place of relations, a collection of essays edited by Yasmin Saikia and Amit Bhaisho that came in 2017, makes an interesting claim about the book and its difference from earlier scholarship. 
It says, using local vocabularies of human relationships that persuasively engage distant history through intimate remembered histories, alongside an exploration of complex current issues of concern to local societies as well as the global audience. The global audience, obviously, because both writers are based in the US, and many of the writers in the volume, this is an edited collection, Most, many of them are based in the in US universities. So new interpretative frameworks are offered in this book for making Northeast accessible on its own terms of dynamism and unfolding histories. Several kinds of relationships are projected here, especially between past and present, and essays in the volume engage with the developing idea of the Northeast while addressing state-specific issues. And the other book, of course, I mentioned was that of Strangers No More. Sorry, not 2017. Sanjay Hazarika's book is from 2018. Interestingly, neither book, both talk about relations, but neither book mentions the work of Glisson, Edward Glisson's work on relations. So the challenge appears to be to present diversity and unity as mobile and flexible. Given the unique enmeshing of past and present, of folk and modern, of the oral and the written, as well as the category of the Northeast itself, which is both composite and multiple, what we need is a model of thinking that will contain and explain this uniqueness and actually take note of the manner in which it is sustained. So I'm thinking that we cannot resolve this problem of the Northeast, and you can think about it from various disciplines. I don't think anybody has succeeded in resolving the Northeast itself as a uh, dual kind of category where individuals are uh, given prominence and the en collective entity is given prominence. You have things like the NESO, the Northeast Students' Organizations. It's a body where all student groups from the northeastern states come together. So it's a collective group of students from all the northeastern states. So there are things like this which actually would uh, you know, lend some amount of authority to the kind of thinking that I hope we will be able to do eventually. So one way of organizing thinking on this might be through literary history. A thought that has been in my mind, actually it's implicit through everything I'm saying here, a literary historian's evaluation of the site is factored into the interpretation of its literature. The two processes are conjoined since the goal is to eventually establish the relation between text and context. But the contextual material requires a multidisciplinary effort with the literary historian drawing on the work of relevant disciplines. What would be the process of such borrowing? Uh, Vinay Dharvarkar has used two terms, leaking and aperture to speak of intermingling and enmeshing, arguing for a kind of permanent aperture inside the discursive formation of Indian English literature, he is writing about Indian English, uh, through which the pre-colonial, the non-colonial, and the colonial, and most recently the post-colonial, have constantly leaked into each other. So how do how would we let other disciplines enter into our concerns i think that's a model a similar sense of enabling porosity is worth taking on as part of the critical repertoire while working with the material of other disciplines the capacity to work with the resources of language folk practice and ritual and religion and contemporary realities in identifying themes that cut across cultural differences would mean keeping them in sight for potential relationships as we read the literature in its associations, similarities, affinities, and its distinctive cultural anchors, the view of an integrated region and a corresponding one of highly individualized and politically distinct states is reinforced. The large theme acquires value precisely because of such simultaneity of disputes and affinities, and this sense needs to be established as an epistemological habit. Elizabeth de Lafrey, a very brief look at her work, defines the term she coined for reading island cultures as archipelagraphy, this is her definition, a historiography that considers chains of islands in fluctuating relationship to their surrounding seas, islands, and continents. Very specific to island studies, but while her work as an aspect of island studies has been influential for readings of literary texts that actually represent islands and 
archipelagos. As historiography for a distinctive kind of relationality, it is hospitable to other objects of knowledge that exist in fluid relationships, especially because of the associations with Edward Glisson's Poetics of Relation, which in turn acknowledges a debt to the rhizomatic thinking of Toulouse and Guattari. The rhizome is an enmeshed root system a network spreading either in the ground or in the air with no predatory rootstock taking over permanently. Sam has always had a position like this, so this quote really struck me particularly. Throughout this essay, the one sense that has been a constant is that of fluid relationships between past and present, between recorded history and oral memory, between English writing and the vernacular oral, but above all, between the united idea of the Northeast and the political divisions and cultural distinctions of individual states. A regular nudging and shoving coming together and separating, similar to what is described of the archipelago, but also of archipelagraphy, which both disassembles and reassembles. Intangible relationships, communication, and tangible political cooperation might be examples of this. Delafri cites Paul Sherrard, whose description moves the term into other potential sites. And Sherrard says this, an archipelago is a loose system that does not homogenize its constituent islands. Each is unique but all are interconnected and they owe their identity not just to what they individually contain, but to the sea between them. Sea here being not empty space, but road, history, cultural text. I think that that's a sort of bridge that we might use. Sharad could have well been talking about the Northeast. So thinking about the Northeast with the archipelago metaphor is a possibility that might anchor the approach that I've tried to suggest here as necessary, one that is hospitable to a diversity of material that refuses to privilege any one over the other because it is attuned to the way each state has produced its own Anglophone writing that recognizes road history, cultural text, connecting them like the sea in the archipelago. And precisely because of this acquired habit of keeping a number of things floating simultaneously in the mind, able to shape those large connections that best frame particular cultures, individual authors, and the single text. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dutta, for that wonderful lecture. Uh, if the audience and the participants have questions, comments, Good morning, ma'am. You had in your lecture you had mentioned that the trope of the outsider or the foreigner is an important trope in the northeast. And in the essay you had provided about the archery tradition, there's a there's a passage, there, there's a text in which which mentions a ceramic plate from Kolkata. And this particular symbol is supposed to be a symbol of buying something from the outside. So I felt that it's interesting that you know, even though we conceive, we in the sense Indians outside the Northeast, conceive of Northeast as a part of India, uh, the perception of the Northeast, and as you said, I'm not seeing it as a monolithic entity, the perception of Northeast may be, slight, may be different. As in we, we take it for granted that we are all one country or one geographical area, but this particular passage points out that it's not, I mean, the perceptions may not agree as we think they do. Outside thing, I just uh, touched on it. It's there in some of the poems as well. I think one of the poems I gave from Desmond that also mentions the outsider. There is a term in Meghalaya, Dakar, I think. Any Khasi speakers here? Dakar. I grew up in Shilong, so this is a term we heard completely. Dakars are supposed to be outsiders. So there's already a term existing. But the history of Meghalaya. No, we only know the colonial history of these regions, don't we? And once the anthropologists went high and low, very early, and produced all those uh, volumes, very early has four books on the Northeast, and as well as an autobiography. He married a uh, Khasi lady, and he lived in Shillong, he's buried there. So all this is part of that history. But it's not, colonialism is not the starting point for the Northeast. So there has been a long history of indigenous leaders, rajas, sayings, they were called. So this is already there, and I was telling Ramon and Anna at the start that 
in a history of uh, Meghalaya, written by history of the Khasis. It's not history of Meghalaya. History of the Khasis. There is this information that somewhere in the 1600s or so, the Khasi CMs had written uh, documents in Bengali, old Bengali, in Arabic and Persian. Hmm? I have no idea, I don't know that history at all. So I'm just sharing this little bit with you. But obviously, colonialism is not where it begins. Hmm? So there have been people coming, there have been interactions throughout the region. You, you will see UN sign mentions the region in his book. After that, Bernier, Cabernier, these people have written about the Northeast. So, colonialism is a kind of artificial starting point that we often use in order to talk about these issues. The outsider group actually came up because the inner line permit, the bringing of Bengalis from uh, East Bengal to settle in the plains of the sand. There were these historical occurrences as well as terms which came in, and, you know, there was a term uh, in uh, one Asmi's text, Lakhina Dilgura had used this term there. They used the term Bongal. Bongal is not a derogatory term. Bongal was a term not for Bengalis, but for all outsiders. And this is a text from the late 19th century. So this term has been circulating. It's only when the Assam movement happened that the outsider, foreigner, and specifically in Assam is a term was with Bohira Gato, so somebody from outside, Bahir, Bohira Gato. Those terms were used at that time and were given a great deal of prominence in the media. I think it's from then that this whole thing about outsiders and insiders became much more part of the circulation of the I hope Manipur, and Manipur also has a term for outsiders, Maya. So, uh, I mean, that's not my question, or that's not my observation at all. Uh, so, what I found in reading Northeast writings, especially in English, is that all of these writers who concentrate themselves in this part of Megalia, I mean, Shimon, they talk about the anxiety of the foreign, but most of them, not most of them, like people like Robin Hamo, as well as the Chilao. Like they are I mean Robin is a Manipuri living in Shillong. Robin is a he was a, actually is a batchmate. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and Techila Awo is also an Awo living in Assam. So how do you find the threat of like the foreign foreign people like coming out from these people who also has this conflict of belongingness? Very interesting question because I think this is at the heart of how more and more uh, we are constructing a kind of exceptionalism for the Northeast. Now we want to be exceptional. Now there was a time when we were really out of it. Here was very famous uh, you know, letter from Kopinat Bhatti you know, that about letting the Northeast fend for itself and so on. So those things are the part of that history. But I think periodically, of course, there are these eruptions. Northeast students in uh, India's metropolises and how they are treated and all that is there. Floods and the state of national uh, government doesn't do anything about it. But this discourse has always been there. But at the same time, I think more and more, we like the idea you know, of being exceptional. And I, I have an echo of Agamben's state of exception, which he used to talk about the US, but uh, if you think about that term and what it can lend as a sort of way for thinking, we like being exceptional. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, I also have, I also have uh, some other observations. Like, do you find that English writings are a threat to the, not just to the regional well, text, but also the threat to regional dialects? Like, for example, Hindi as a transactional language has uh, dissolved the Nefamis, yeah, the Nefamis that was existed in in uh, Arunachal Pradesh. Now Hindi is more like the, uh, like the transactional language there. So do you find that English writing or English as a as a uh, interchangeable dialect or language among these states is a threat to the regional dialect? I think it would 
be again different in different states. You're from Manipur, I'm from Assam. In both these states, there are existing, very strong existing literary traditions. You have the Chetara Kumbhava, we have the Buranji, so there is a historical tradition as well. But, and also interestingly, I think English writing is not that strong in Manipur and Assam as it has been in Navaland and in Meghalaya. Right? And a lot of poetry from Mizoram and Arunachal also coming on Arunachal, Mamanda is there from Arunachal. But this is one thing there. Where there is a very strong written tradition, that threat is not there. But I think in the others, they are now trying to resolve this threat by uh, what I said in my talk, that there is a lot more use of local terms, local usages, folk, Desmond's essay on the Fawad, he works a great deal on folklore. So using these, making these known, I think that's one way of countering what could be a problem. And uh, also in Manipur, since Vaisnavism was a huge influence from the early 18th century, uh, Christian missionaries were not a threat at all. Like, I mean, it was only a threat, not a threat, it only came into like the far very far peripheries uh, of our history. So, what I observe is that uh, the magazines, the USSR magazines in English, especially Soviet land. Soviet land has a very strong influence on like the many uh, English practitioners. Like, I have some like close relatives who have published their their uh, articles in Soviet land and had a and had a opportunity to travel the USSR satellite states there. And yeah, I guess that's it. And also last thing, uh, I I hope I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm not stopping other people from asking the questions. Uh, what do you find out says and to one taking the initiative to publish not his writings? Like are they trying to homogenize nice nice they in their writing from these texts or should we leave it to independent then publishers to do this? Like how how else Hobby Roy has been doing it? I mean, are they interested in the politics of homogenizing? Is the market for them? And I think around my book also came out in a series of from Sage, and a whole lot of other people also got books from uh, that. That is the Northeast series, I think. And Rockledge also had a similar series where another cluster of books came out. I think they were responding to a kind of growing interest in the region, and also I cynically I would say that that was finding new areas for publication. You've exhausted certain things, so you find a new area there. That's also there. I, I don't put too much, set too much store by that. But actually, the role of publishers is important. Maybe that's not where we need to look at. Maybe we need to look at how, why, what, in greater detail. Mm. almost of, so we say, northeast of India. So it somehow feels like we are describing that region by a direction compared to the mainland, uh, not by a name of its own. Like I might be wrong here because I don't know so much about uh, northeastern British and its history. Uh, but uh, it sounds like it's, so this name is a colonial import. Uh, so is it problematic uh, to still use the term? Or have there, any, uh, have there been any alternative names in the history of the region? NEFA was the term that they used, not the Stranko Agency. How to, in fact, very relevant is such an interesting figure because he wrote the book called Philosophy for NEFA. That's the title essay in that collection, where he's actually offering a program for how to deal with the Northeast. But that book came in response to, I don't know if I can find it, uh, five uh, points made by Nehru in a commission for the scheduled castes where he had given this lecture where he talked about how the Northeast should be treated. And Elvin and Nehru together kind of thought about 
uh, ways to deal with the Northeast, letting them do their own thing, not really imposing anything from outside on them and so on. Nehru actually says all that in that lecture. So all of this is there as part of the history of how the term has come into circulation. You will also find it in earlier, uh, you know, those uh, survey, the big survey accounts are there. Pemberton, for example, did a long survey of the Eastern Front, Eastern Himalayas. And the term Northeast Frontier actually comes in there. But as I said, you know, exceptionalism is what we are thinking of now. Now I think nobody wants to give up the term. Why would we give it up? And you will find that people like Santi Burwa, writers like Santi Burwa, have started using frontier and border once again, newly thinking the area as a frontier region, as a border region, primarily with relation to the connections that one can have with the far east, with uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand. These are places where the middle Connections, historical, racial connections. So uh, that connection is also there. So that frontier thing that began as part of colonial policy or colonial, colonial administration, that has now been taken on both by the central government, which talks about northeast frequently, but also by people there who find it a useful term to designate themselves as different. Mm -hmm. So now it's useful. I mean, I'm not representing anybody's opinion here, personal opinion. It's very useful. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm from Kerala. I study at Jammu and uh, And I did my bachelor's from Kerala. It was my master's in Jammu. And during uh, my bachelor's, I never encountered a text from Northeast if it's in English. And even during my master's, I had a paper in Indian writing in English, and I never found something uh, from the Northeast. And I think we have a paper in this semester, it's called Literature from the Margins, and that has a Northeast section. And whenever, I, I will be honest with you, uh, when, I, when I got the statistic readings, I wasn't very interested in even starting the reading, because even in my mind, Northeast was at the margins because, I, uh, as part of I, my readings were formed by the syllabus, and I, even in the syllabus it was marginalized. And I, I, I had no idea about what. Uh, I had recently read the book. Uh, Mid uh, I think it was Midnight Borders by Sujitra Vijay, and that's the only encounter I have with Northeast. She describes her travels in Assam and all those areas, and. Uh, how do you, how, 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 means, uh, what do you think about how a syllabus is affecting uh, the way we perceive literacy, especially in the writing of literature? And this ha this, I think this happens to other things too, like uh, the rich literature is classified as one of its own and it's never included in the main verses. And, uh, and as I think you have talked about exceptionalism, but how much do you think it affects the uh, popularity of Northeast in the whole I think it also has to do with the work that is now coming out, essays being written on various texts from the Northeast and unfortunately published in journals like South Asia Review and Post Colonial Studies and all that. So there is a more global kind of readership coming in. And uh, gathering of Northeast scholars at the University of Oklahoma, I think it was at one point some years back. That has been happening for a while, so you have some visibility. But you know, given the theoretical attractiveness of the idea of marginality, I think that also has had to do with how the Northeast has presented itself. You know, that has been a. I think we wanted to present ourselves like that. But when you talk about syllabus, actually, I agree with you. We had this debate in our department at one point. Mizoram was the first university to introduce a full paper on Northeast literature. We resisted it for a long time. In fact, we had it as an optional text somewhere. Then we put in a few in the women's literature paper. So by default, one or two texts would end up. But uh, 
Now we have a paper on North. It's, a, it's still uh, an elective paper, but we have a full paper on North East writing where translations also figure because uh, since we are situated in Assam, we feel that a lot of English translations, not so much of the, of the translations of fiction are very bad, but the translations of some of the prose writings, I mentioned one there, uh, German academic ideals, these were originally written in English, but there are translations of works by people like that. And those are now part of that Northeast syllabus. So I think syllabus has a huge role to play in the way we uh, center something and marginalize something else. It's the politics we talk about with our students as well, that why is a certain text there and others not there? Why, for example, are we teaching a certain Shakespeare text and not some other Shakespeare text? Even that becomes part of that argument. So yeah, I would agree with you that this is marginal and I don't know how or whether we even need to counter it. But certainly now that it is part of this Indian writing in English program, it's part of Indian writing in English. However, I think it would have the kind of relationship that Southern writing had in American literary histories. In the regions, they were given as a given separate place. I think that's one way of writing Indian English writing history, literary histories of Indian English writing where the regions have some place, because I think we are seeing a clarity there that Bengal English, where you have Amitabh uh, Ghosh and Amit Chaudhary and so many others coming from there, you have from Maharashtra, you have from uh, the Northeast. So that region-wise division might be one way of thinking about literary history, in which case there is a place for it within the mainstream literary history of Indian English literature. I don't know if that answers your question. Professor Dutta, if I may ask you a question. My own work is on periodicals, English periodicals during the Raj. So, and you mentioned I don't know that, for example. So, could you tell us about the contribution of English periodicals from the Northeast, could be Assam, for example, or Meghalaya, for as in how did they contribute to the rise of Indian English literature from that region or from a particular location, for example? In Assam, you know, all the periodicals. I must say all because I can't think of a single English periodical from Assam. They are all in Assamese. But they formed a very important part of the development of Assamese literature. I'm not bilingual. I don't write bilingual. Myself. I'm not a bilingual scholar. But uh, if you look at the development of Assamese literature, you'll see that much of it began with the periodicals. And these would be Bahi, Lokhina, Vesborwa, that period on to the present. And uh, the other regions, because the writing came so late in most of them, Manipur, I don't know if there are English periodicals, are there? But in the other places, now you have one or two, but I don't think from the period you were talking of, you know, I don't think there are many, many periodicals you would actually find. Ormudai had another, that also was in Assamese. There was another one which the wives of some of the missionaries had brought out. Some light together to get the name land or like something, and we will let you know later. But uh, English periodicals, no. Or did the missionaries have a role to play in the second half of the 19th century, for example? Like, as in, in Calcutta, they had periodicals such as the Calcutta Review mm. uh, brought out by the missionaries, or the Serampur, the missionaries yeah, in Serampur right. had their own periodicals, both in Bangla and in uh, English. So, mm. did the missionaries in uh, Assam, for example, or other parts of the Northeast? No, 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 they did. They all brought out Assamese periodicals. Orunodha runs to so many volumes, it's a huge collected thing now. But uh, English periodicals. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any more questions? Comments? Good morning, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I wanted to ask something with reference to two questions that have been asked. Uh, one with the syllabus and the other with English being a main medium of expression. So it is a uh, commonly known fact that English is a very significant medium of expression in the Northeast, primarily because of how uh, prominently it is taught and trained, how uh, the writers are trained from a very young age with the language, uh, more so than the rest of the country. So what, uh, and considering English, even though it is a colonial language, uh, it is used very uh, dominantly because you know you want to cater to a bigger audience of sorts in the western as well as within the mainland itself. 
for what reason do you think it is not a dominant part of a syllabus despite of fulfilling the main criteria which is using English as a main language of propagation of ideas? I'm not sure I can answer that, you know. What is the reason syllabus makers don't put it in the syllabus? I think it's very specific to the institution in which you're working. I think it has to do with that. With popularity, availability, that is certainly there. Now this literature is available. Now, and it's happening at the level of PhD dissertations. There are innumerable proposals coming up from various universities on Northeast writing. And the same things, as I said at the start, the same things are replicated. But why syllabus makers don't put it, I don't know. Anna, Pramod, why don't you put it in the syllabus? You have it? Uh, we have it as a part of Indian Yeah. I suppose so. So then, somebody would have to be the next Amitabh Ghosh to feature without question in a syllabus, win a book or win some other prize and get it. I don't know. I really don't know that. I don't have an answer to that. Because we didn't want to put it in either. And our, I had a reason. I'll tell you what, the reason I objected when we argued about this in the department. Should we have a paper? We don't have a syllabus like you. We have a fixed syllabus. So when we were making the syllabus, the question of whether we should have a full paper on Northeast writing did come, came up. And uh, my argument was that, one is that we don't have the uh, surrounding material for it. We don't have the streets, we don't have collections, anthologies, just the two anthologies you know, I think, uh, both by Robin and uh, King Tom, those are the anthologies of poetry. And there is that Oxford two-volume anthology of Northeast writing, much of which is in translation. So those are the collections. Without anthologies, if you look at the start of disciplines, I think that's where it begins. That the collections must be available. One book from Penguin or one from Zuban is not enough. You must have a sense of the field. We didn't have a sense of the field. So I think that's one of the reasons why I would object for the inclusion of anything is this, that what is the material we have? Just the one literary text, then we are going to be replicating the same ideas again and again on that text. Because we don't know anything about the text. That's one, one problem. And another very interesting case of a new department, which is part of the English department, is in Nagaland University. This is the department of Kennedy. Kennedy is uh, one of the Naga dialects. And you have a department there of Kennedy writing. Because they don't have Kennedy scholars, so I happened to be on their board and I had to sit in on some of the interviews. So this is the question that struck me, that you are starting this department. What is the work as uh, aspiring members of the faculty you have to do? And I think that was the first thing. Gather that material, put it together, tell us something about it. You know, write a literary history of it. When did Teneki begin? It started as oral. So that problem, I think, is uh, something that might Otherwise, I don't know what else is the reason for not If there are no more questions, I think we'll break for tea now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Dutta. Thank you so much.